There's nothing like it in North America. It's a unique opportunity to showcase uh, racing uh, blended with uh, showcasing you know, new technology in an atmosphere that is fun for everybody in the entire family. So, you know, what's unique about Velocity today is the average age is under 40 uh, for over 55 or 80, 55 or 58 percent of our, our guests. So we really have something for every family. The public loves racing. They love cars. They love seeing, hearing, and smelling them. And I and and it's a little bit of delight and surprise as you walk through the paddock. And you might be walking past a 1962 250 GTO, Ferrari GTO, um, you know, that raced at Le Mans. And then you'll go another 50 feet, but you'll find the rally car, you know, that won the, uh, you know, the career of Pan America and so it's just this uh, unique experience uh, to, to showcase all these different uh, parts of racing. Look, our view from the beginning was bring your cars, bring great cars, uh, and but, but we want everybody to have access. We want them to be able to go up. We want them to be able to talk to the drivers. We want them to be able to see the cars and get up close. So many of these cars obviously don't normally come out of their uh, collections but we're bringing them out and then the access that spectators have is second to none. Hi, this is Jeff O'Neill with Cars and Culture and Jason Stein, again. Welcome into Sirius XM. What a pleasure to have you back on the program, Jeff. Jason, it's great to be here. It's uh, always been uh, such a pleasure to watch your success with the show. Well, thanks so much. I've got to get to it right off the top. You just returned from Monaco. You're making, um, uh, you, you become very popular, from what I understand, in the in the YouTube world for an interesting reason. But tell me about gearboxes in Monaco, if you could. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, uh, for the, the the good news is um, the the car survived. The bad news is I blew the uh, transmission um, going down the front straight um, uh, in Monaco and did uh, a couple of three sixties, um, which uh, which has been widely viewed uh, on YouTube. Well, we'll have to share that then, won't we? <laughs> we will. We will. We will. We'll, That's we'll, un we'll unintended on. publicity. <laughs> How is it? How is how is that driving the track? Is this your first time, or have you done it before? No, it's my it's my third time at Monaco. It is absolutely a pinch yourself uh, moment where we're driving historic cars that 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 uh, participated there. Uh, in my case, it's a Maserati 250F Formula One car from 1957, and then uh, a 1956 Mille Miglia uh, Maserati 350S. Uh, which is the one that just literally came out of restoration ten days ago. With the, you could still smell the paint. And, wow! Uh, but fortunately, the paint didn't get scratched. But the transmission needs a little bit of work. Yeah, you didn't hit the wall, did you? Did not hit the wall. And Monaco, that's a that's a hard thing to avoid. Um, but I mean, a pinch me moment, of course. Uh, you're putting yourself right in the middle of history. Every turn, I'm sure you probably have even before you hit the track. You've every turn memorized. You know, you know the tunnel, and you know the, you know the or the um uh, the tight loop that goes in front of the Fairmont Hotel. I mean, it's rich with history, Jeff. It really is. I mean, Monaco is such a special place. Um, I, I have to, I must say that it is so unique to be there running these cars, these very, very unique cars that, that were there in period. I mean, it's just a, again, it's a pinch me moment. Wow. Uh, you, as a child, did you grow up as a fan of formula one? Not really. I, we've just, I grew up as a fan of racing period. And, and as a child, I grew up with, you know, little regional SCCA, going to races with my dad and that's right. uh, you know in the early days he just took his he would drive a mg td to the track and and run it but as you know tds with their 1100 cc's is not exactly the most competitive car on the track yeah well what a great opportunity uh and other great opportunities are ahead of you and ahead of everybody else i can't believe it we talked to you almost two years ago 
the fifth anniversary of the Velocity Invitational, I'm already getting the marketing for it to say, reserve your seat now, reserve your spot now. Uh, can you believe it's been five years? Well, it is kind of amazing, honestly. Uh, you know, this it got created out of my desire to create a, a an awesome racing event um, that people could come and enjoy and have wine and and have a beautiful place to sit and have food and and be entertained. And it has evolved over those five years into really a a, a unique venue where we can showcase new cars, old cars, off road cars. Um, you know, we now have the opportunity. We built an off road rally course. Um, so we can do on track, off track. It's, it's really been an amazing evolution, uh, to bring so many unique racing elements, uh, and then new technology. So we, of course, last year had, uh, McLaren there. We had the brand new release of the Ford GT. Um, and then over the weekend, we had just over 20,000 fans, uh, come to the event, which was really, really fantastic. You and I talked last time about the comparisons to Goodwood. Festival of Speed, uh, Goodwood in general. Do you feel like you're getting closer from a North American perspective? Well, I think, you know, there's nothing like it in North America. It's a unique opportunity to showcase uh, racing uh, blended with uh, showcasing, you know, new technology in an atmosphere that is fun for everybody in the entire family. So, you know, what's unique about Velocity today is the average age is under 40 uh, for over 55 or 80, 55 or 58 percent of our our guests, so we really have something for every family. What have you learned in the last five years that you didn't know back in you know 2019? Well, all things all things start about? with being naive that you can build a event overnight, and uh, you know we've continually built it. At the first year, we had. 3,500 guests. The second, we had about 7,000. Then we had 10. And then last year, we had uh, just over 21,000. So um, I, I think uh, one one of the learnings was it does take a little bit um, to bring people uh, together again and again, and then to grow that. But, uh, but it appears to be growing more exponentially now, which is really wonderful. What's the elevator pitch for the event? You know, it's uh, the elevator pitch is it's a unique opportunity to come with your family to see extraordinary cars that come out of garages that people haven't seen in 20 and 30 years. And then not only to see them uh, uh, standing in the paddock, but to actually see them racing and hearing them and smelling them on the track. And then when you're finished watching racing, you can come and, and look at whatever the newest McLaren, Lamborghini, Mercedes, you know, all on display. So it's just a very unique opportunity to see cars uh, that that you really cannot normally get up close, touch, sit in, and uh, experience. I've always said it, it's it's the closest that that you can get to that old and new technology, and and it is dripping with culture. Are you building a culture with Velocity? Have you well, built? I, I I think we are. I mean, um, what you know, we call it the Velocity Invitational for a reason. It's uh, all of the drivers are invited. We want these special cars. We want interaction uh, with the spectators. And we've of course had relationships with Mercedes and with McLaren and with other F1 um, uh, teams. So we think that this blend of you know providing you know beautiful cars, racing. Uh, and then the, some of the oldest technology and some of the newest technology. And it's just an amazing showcase. You've said that you'd like to have more direct automaker participation at the event. How is the OE participation going? It goes fine. I mean, it's just, you know, at, at every year, you know, we're building, you know, we've had uh, Ford and Polestar and Porsche. Uh, and, you know, it's a unique opportunity for them to showcase cars and actually get people in the cars either on track or or on the road. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you, we want everything to happen in the first year, but it's taken four or five years you know to to prove that that we have a unique venue here that is it's unlike anything else in North America. Is it fair to suggest that Velocity is actually the dynamic version of Luftkittgeld? Yeah, I guess yeah. I yes, you could say that. Um uh you know, I think um you know, we're trying to bring, you know, many many different elements, right? So 
which includes, you know, I mean, everything, as I said earlier, on-road, off-road, new, old, and everything in between. Wonderful. Uh, as you think about the concept of, of you know, velocity really uh, transforming and, and the metamorphosis that it will go through, does at some point it deserve a theme, almost like an honored mark to some extent that we see that at Pebble, we, right? We, we see it all over the place in, in other get togethers. Yeah, I think ultimately, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, what we want to continue to show is, you know, new technology, we want to continue to entertain. So, um, you know, there we, we could start naming marks. Um, but, you know, for example, obviously, the last year was really kind of Le Mans 100. Yeah. So um, we had a lot of Le Mans cars. Um, this year, you know, we're really featuring a lot of the very, very special 19 mid 1950s race cars. So we'll have a number of historic Maserati race cars from that period, you know, along with a very large collection of D type Jags and C type Jags that that all would have participated in Le Mans in period. You've got a number of cool features for this fifth year. I want to walk through some of them. And so far, you've announced two really cool elements for fans. The get sideways with Ryan. Is it Turk sweepstakes? Turk. Yep. Turk. Yeah. yeah. And everybody who purchases a ticket before July 4th will be automatically entered to win a ride along with Ryan around the Sonoma Raceway. How did that come to be? Well, that came to be because we're again we're we're trying to uh, entertain and and delight, and to be able to have Ryan Turk show up and uh, and give one of these extraordinary rides. I mean, it will be a unique experience from one of the greatest drivers in the world. Yeah, you also have another ride along as well, a rally ride along with Group B legends and the lineup of I guess it's Dirtfish Rally experiences, right? Tell me about that. It, it, it is. Uh, Dirtfish has been an amazing partner for us. Uh, we introduced it uh, last year. It was incredibly successful. Um, you know, it just brings another element. And we're probably the only place in North America where you will have a, a road racing track along with a three-mile uh, dirt uh, rally track and uh, their team is coming Josie's coming and uh, these amazing drivers uh, it is so extraordinary uh, to ride with these folks uh, in these cars and everybody will get a chance if they want to where did the idea of doing dirt come from well I will tell you uh, at my age when I think about racing I always thought about road racing and I always thought about 1950s, 60s, and what we've recognized over the years, and and frankly, and I've become a complete fan, there are so many elements to racing that are entertaining and fun. And so showcasing this broad range, you know, has really been a goal. And there's nothing that at, at Velocity that will ever be off limits. So the idea of bringing these incredible rally cars, these rare rally cars, uh, to the track and their drivers is just another uh, element to add to the entertainment. Group B rally cars, in fact, as well as the modern day rally cars. So your audience changes a little bit, I, I guess, with the with the addition of of these elements, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. And what I think it shows is is that the the public loves racing. They love cars. They love seeing, hearing, and smelling them. And I and and it's a little bit of delight and surprise as you walk through the paddock and you might be walking past a 1962 250 GTO Ferrari GTO, um, you know, that raced at Le Mans and then you'll go another 50 feet, but you'll find the rally car, you know, that won the, uh, you know, the Carrera Pan America. And so it's just this, uh, unique experience, uh, to, to showcase all these different, uh, parts of racing. And you're right. It doesn't really exist anywhere to get to have these kinds of opportunities, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Because what what led me to start this in the first place is you come to the races and it was just a bunch of guys with old cars. Some were good, some were not so good, some were prepared correctly, some weren't. And there was nowhere to go sit. There was nowhere to view. There was nowhere to have a lovely lunch. And, and I thought, 
why would we not want to have families come and enjoy this incredible experience? And that's really what the driver was from. So, you know, and now we've, you know, we just keep taking it to the next step. And by bringing, you know, the Formula One, um, you know, historic Formula One, current Formula One um, driver, indie drivers, we'll have a number of indie drivers this year. Um, so we're really excited about that as well. Can you share some of that, even I, and what you just walked through? So the historic F ones to the modern day to indie drivers. So who's committed? Can you can you share some of that? You know, we I think we're saving that for an announcement later. Okay. Um, uh, but but we are planning on significant uh, indie drivers. We're we're in the process because we haven't brought all the cars together yet. So we want to put them in historic indie cars as well. Mm. Um, and then uh, you know at the appropriate time we'll announce it. But unfortunately. You know, I wish I could just say it today, but I can't. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll wait for that for sure. Um, last year, Zach Brown and the McLaren team uh, made an appearance. Was it uh, Lando Norris was there too? Correct. They certainly were. So yeah. McLaren was celebrating their 60th anniversary here in North America, uh, and it was just extraordinary. We had three of the McLaren Indy drivers plus Lando. Norris, uh, who, as you probably just saw, he won his first Grand Prix in uh, Miami, which was totally awesome. Podium uh, at uh, Imola. Uh, pardon me? He also podiumed at... Uh, and I then podium Imola. at mm -hmm. uh, Imola. He almost caught Max on the last lap. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty wild race there. Uh, and, of course, Zach Brown has just been you know, a big part of our event for the past three years. He's an extraordinary guy. Um uh, it, you know, always bringing excitement and great stories. We've had Zach on this program. He is a car guy to the core. He's almost uh, he's almost the poster guy for your movement, isn't he? I mean, a racer at heart, also incredibly down to earth and um, and very focused on preserving car culture. He's Zach. If you could create a poster behind you that said "Velocity," I'm, Zach would be on it. I'm sure. Yeah, Zach should be on it, and yeah. uh, and his car collection should be on it, and because he's got uh, you know very unique historic cars, important cars. Um, I mean, last year we brought Zach brought from the McLaren collection, you know, most of the winning winning Senna cars, which was very very unique, and they hadn't been seen, uh, let alone raced um, uh, in a demonstration in North America ever. When you talk about making velocity a little bit different, one of the elements and I guess a highlight, I guess, of the recipe is making access easy for spectators, paddock access with every ticket, right? Can you expand a little bit on that and just your thinking behind it? Yeah, look, our view from the beginning was bring your cars, bring great cars. Uh, and, but, but we want everybody to have access. We want them to be able to go up. We want them to be able to talk to the drivers. We want them to be able to see the cars and get up close. So many of these cars obviously don't normally come out of their, uh, collections, but we're bringing them out. And then the access that spectators have is second to none. Uh, I mean, throughout the years, I mean, you could get right up and see these incredibly special Ayrton Senna cars, uh, Mercedes back in uh, 2019, getting close to, um, you know, one of these in amazing supercars, uh, which you really can. If you go to a Formula One race, you know, you're pretty far away unless you really exclusive ticket, um, which are, you know, obviously incredibly expensive. And we're an opportunity to come and see how these race teams operate and how they run their cars. But you can walk right up to them. Not only can you walk right up to them, you can talk to the mechanics, you can talk to the drivers, you can talk to everybody. And I love that. You can also sip a glass of world-class wine, as as your marketing material indicates, uh, along with that paddock access with every ticket. I want to talk a little bit about that. Also, the, the Sip and Savior Pavilion, which has tasting booths from local wine, spirits, food vendors, live entertainment, all at the trackside location. You and I talked about this a couple of years ago. How has the culinary piece of this, the, that's the other cultural piece, Jeff, how has that changed? Well, I think, uh, you know, when people come to events today, right, there's a lot of car culture, there's cars and coffee, there's a lot of things. But th th when you come to Velocity, you can experience everything from 
you know, sitting down and having a lovely lunch, a glass of champagne, watching the track, uh, walking through the Sip and Savor Pavilion, which, you know, over the course of three days, we have 30 local wineries all getting rotated through. So it's really a fun, unique experience. And we're really trying to, you know, entertain a very broad group group of of folks that that love cars, but you don't have to know every detail about the car. It's it's very entertaining uh, to come see. Some people came to get Lando's autograph. Some people came to see Zach Brown. Some people came to see a 250 GTO Ferrari race against a 250 short wheelbase Ferrari, which you know is incredibly rare these days to get. Uh, amazing cars like that on the track. So again, it's just, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, venues at the track um, to, you know, everything from simulators, off-road, on-road, uh, plus in between, you can sit down and have a delicious lunch. You said you want to over-deliver on making great wines. And I want to get into the wine, uh, an update on the wine business here in a second, but you have always wanted to over-deliver on making those great wines and making them customer centric. Is that also true for Velocity? Yeah, I think it is. When I think about Velocity and I think about my own business, um, I think the reason consumers and spectators, they come back because they say, wow, for for what I paid for this, I got this amazing, unbelievable experience. And that's, you know, I think that's just true in life. You know, why are certain things successful? It's because you know, you, you've put that extra effort and we always talk about it as the last 5%, you know, a lot of times you get the 95%, but it's the last 5% that kind of bring you back to that great restaurant that brings you back, you know, to that great winery or brand or what have you. So it's, it's always the ab it's taking it right to the edge. Yeah. We talked about winemaking at length last time. I wanted, I want a bit of an update. As I said, you're one of the largest winemakers in California and really the world. How's it going? Well, the wine business has been interesting. The uh, it's going through a transition right now, where you know the the consumer, uh, some of them are getting a little older and drinking a little less, and some of the younger ones um, are not drinking as much, but they're drinking better. So hmm. the uh, the industry is is going through a transition. Um, you know, and, and we're transitioning with it. And that's that's because consumers today, particularly wine consumers, particularly young ones, you know, they have more disposable income. They want better wines. So our goal is how do we continue just to deliver better wines? And that means, you know, wines from Paso Robles uh, and Sonoma. We just acquired um, the winery across the street from the racetrack, Ramsgate, which I've been a partner in for for years uh, and actually, I helped. I, I was really instrumental in the construction and building of it in the uh, in 2011. Um, but I was always a minority partner, and now we have uh, you know taken over the entire uh, facility, which is conveniently located next to the racetrack. Yeah. When did that change occur in the wine making movement, or in the wine industry rather? Well, it really changed. I mean, it's sort of changed slowly, but. Uh, but look, as as consumers become more affluent with more disposable income, you know, they're not just aspirational buyers. They're looking for just better quality, period. So the mm -hmm. wines of 30 years ago that everybody drank are so different than today. Today, the consumer is more sophisticated, more knowledgeable. Um, and, and I think, you know, the wines have to transition with that. So, you know, they've just you know, to the it's it's a little bit like race cars. You know, we have this amazing technology in in winemaking, where um, you know whether it's gentle pressing from presses or filtration that's you know you know you know really done in a natural state. You know, has just simply made wines better. There's a whole movement at work, Jeff, in the in the wine business. We don't get many many winemakers on this program, so forgive me for a minute here. But uh, this is the business channel, after all. Um, there's a whole movement around a coolness related to sobriety that I'm sure you're, you're watching, whether it's called timeouts or resets or five day fasts or, or, you know, you know, prolon. I mean, any, any of those things that are, that have now become sort of trendy, like anything, there's a pendulum. Are you seeing that as well? Are, are fewer people drinking at a younger age? Well, I think, yeah, we're probably, yes, I, you know, I think absolutely, you know, and I, but I think the byword for our industry, the wine industry forever 
has been one of moderation. And, mm -hmm. you know, wine is this civilized beverage that's been around for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a reason it has been around for 5,000 years. It's because it is the beverage of choice with a meal and, and with family. Now, having said that, are people looking for lower alcohol? Absolutely. Are they, is everybody looking for low? Absolutely not. But I, th I think it is uh, incumbent upon us to just find, you know, where those opportunities are. You know, do I want low alk? Do I want no alk? Um, and, you know, and all of those products will be part of a, uh, of a, of a winery's portfolio as we, as we look into the future. And the beverage business is just changing radically with a number of options that exist today, correct? Yeah, they did. I mean, look, they didn't really exist. You go back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, seltzers weren't really a thing. Right. Um, but having said that, there was originally California Cooler, and then there was Smirnoff Ice, and then there was Bartles and James. And so the industry has continued to, it continued to, you know, change over the years. Although, we, you know, now convenience is very, very important for younger consumers. You know, you've got White Claw, and you've got High Noon, and you've got all of these products out there. So there's a lot of consumer choice. I, I, I mean, just walk down the spirit aisle today. Uh, 15 years ago, you probably had a choice of five tequilas. Now, if you're in in a you know a reasonably good uh, liquor store, you've got 50 tequilas to choose right. from. So, consumers today, I, I mean, I mean, you know, it's really their oyster, right? They they get they can kind of pick and choose just about whatever they want. We talked to John Mandel on this program, former head of American Honda, and he's uh, he runs Devil's Creek uh, Distillery now in John's own 2.0 life. Um, uh, that you know, post retirement from the auto industry, and he talks about the difficulties in just getting wine across state lines. Uh, sorry, whiskey across state lines. Do you run into that with wine as well? You know, it's crazy. It's it's the same issue. We all have the same issue. So yeah. back when prohibition was uh, repealed, the states got control of alcohol distribution. So some states have different. Every state has its own laws, and um, you know, and its own liquor commission, and. So it's different shipping to Nevada and Colorado and North Carolina and Georgia and what have you. So the, the, the systems are devised really to keep the three tier system. So whoever was the local distributor kind of really has their hands on this on the steering wheel. So it, it makes it kind of difficult for the consumers in many, many states. It's a little bit easier with wine, but spirits are even more difficult. So it's the, you know, it was a land grab uh, shortly after prohibition by the states uh to control it and then ultimately the the deal that the, the distributors in those states of course you know that they want to continue to have their hand on the control and profit uh of, of wines and spirits so that but that's it's it's difficult but it's it's not something that surprises us because it's been around for a lot right. of years relative to five thousand years california is a junior player in the winemaking world um, we're not talking about DRC here in the Burgundy region um, in terms of history. We might be talking in terms of quality, though. Uh, what's the next region, Jeff, that you're watching that's coming on strong? Well, there's a couple. I, I think there's, um, for sure, the hottest region in California right now is Paso Robles. We happen to have um, a couple of wineries down there, one called Robert Hall. One, uh, one is uh, Rabble uh, Wine Company. Um, and a brand called Intercept, all of which are, you know, dedicated Paso Robles. Those are wines. When you talked earlier about my my mission to how do you over deliver, those wines um, uh, deliver to the customer amazing value. For twenty dollars a bottle, you can get one of the finest uh, either Cabernets, Syrahs, uh, uh, anywhere else in the world, and and it's just one of those unique places. Um, and that's the reason why we uh, we targeted that region because the wines are absolutely delicious. They're up and coming, uh, and they're they're very approachable. Uh, but they're just excellent. And other parts of the world that may be competing against you. I mean, there was you know, whole... there's always you know, there's always you know, Chile and Argentina mm -hmm. and Australia, um, and of course, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs have kind of set the stage. Um, in the U.S. and and around the world because of their unique uh, tropical flavors, um, but I think I think what we're seeing is the consumer again. It's not just spirits and whiskeys, and they have so much choice today. Uh, it, it, it's almost boggling as a consumer. It is. 
you've leaned into sustainability in the winemaking world. How does that translate to the automotive world? Well, I think how do we th when when we when I think about the uh, velocity, I think about what technology has been developed from racing that we use today. And basically, I mean, everything from disc brakes to magnesium to carbon fiber, all of that was demonstrated as being useful in uh, the progression of development of race cars. So all of that translates into building more efficient, better cars. And I know some people might say, well, why would you bother racing a historic car? They were all elements in that ladder of creating whether it's a tesla or a polestar or um or the you know whatever the latest ferrari or lamborghini and this recovery systems and you know battery recovery um making everything more efficient for the consumer and ultimately right it, it's more efficient and sustainable for the world and we look at that in the same way in the wine business right because we're farmers and and so how can we sequester carbon? How can we be more sustainable uh, and be stewards of the land? And I think there is quite a few parallels between the the industry, the auto industry and and the we're just about any industry, honestly. The auto industry is going through a pendulum swing rather quickly. And uh, this is a different conversation today than it was two years ago between the two of us as it relates to EVs. Now we're talking plug-in hybrids and internal combustion and EVs. Do all three of those eventually have a place at Velocity? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, look, I think if you said, what does the future look like at Velocity? It's showcasing everything. It's showcasing speed. Who's the fastest electric car? What's the fastest autonomous car? Um, you know, I just think all of that is going to continue to develop. And I know, you know, we talk to a lot of people in our industry and they say, if I can't hear it and I can't smell it, I don't like it. But I think that's a little bit like the ostrich putting its head in the sand. Um, it is here to stay. There will be amazing cars developed. Um, you know, some of them will be 100 percent electric. Some of them will be hybrids. And then and then some of them will probably continue to be just good old fashioned uh, 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 some sort of gas. But it will probably be a synthetic fuel that ultimately gets developed at scale that, um, that you know, that will be basically carbon neutral, because I think that's the. That, you know, the ultimate goal here is, you know, how do we keep people on the road? I, I, I mean, the, the independence that uh, the automobile gives an individual, I mean, it changed the world back in, you know, what, 1885. I mean, the first time a car went on the road and gave independence to somebody, I mean, it's never changed. So I think that's going to continue around the globe. Velocity is going to showcase racing from every era. Um, and we know that at the turn of the last century, there were steam and electric cars. Will you have some of those this year? I don't know that we have any steam cars coming, but, uh, I, that would be fun. <laughs> to, that would be fun to have, but we'll certainly be showcasing electric cars, uh, gas cars, hybrid cars. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a little bit, a little bit of everything. Let's talk a little bit about the future. You know, we've had Victoria Bruno on this program. She's a Ferrari mechanic. Uh, a young woman who is doing the very rare thing of of wrenching on vehicles that many folks don't even know about. She's a Piston Foundation scholarship winner and is and works vintage cars all the time. You said one of your goals is to get young people to see history. What can be done to, uh, I would say, uh, bring these younger folks into the fold with a caretaking of these artifacts? Well, I think from the from the start, um, it has been a goal of mine to try to bring uh, uh, younger generations in to help with the preservation of the history of these cars. And I think, you know, we see it every single day. For example, my story about my gearbox in Monaco. I guarantee you that's going to get repaired by somebody maybe older than me. <laughs> and 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 we haven't developed these these this learning and we are we're getting there but bringing young people in and they can be on the on the mechanical side on the development side on the you know uh, you know pounding aluminum is a, is a lost art um and then of course you know a lot of the newer cars you know they have a lot of technology in them and when one thing goes wrong the whole thing is um you know you know a, a, a you know a lump of metal sitting there with 
you know, sensors and what have you. So bringing young people in, whether it's, you know, interest in being a mechanic, preservation of leather, interiors, you know, there's just the, 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 the list goes on. I mean, but, you know, you mentioned uh, a, a young woman, why? but I, I also think we it's incumbent upon us as an industry to bring in more women into this into this industry. And, you know, I think it's been kind of a man's domain. And I and it's just kind of silly because, um, you know, it's such a fun opportunity uh, for young people to get engaged. Well, and I'm going to Velocity uh, for the first time this year, and I'm guessing I'm going to see a demographic that is all over the map. Isn't that right, Jeff? You are. You are. You're going to see uh, guys my age, but you're going to see the majority of them are much younger than me. Um, <laughs> we are hugely proud of the fact that uh, Velocity, um, I think the average age is, is you know, about 38, 35, 38. Wow. Yeah. So we have a very, very... Uh, uh, cool uh, demographic there and you know people will find when they come that you know you can bring children we have a, a spectacular playground and you can get great food and if you want to get out of the noise for a little bit you can come into the sip and savor pavilion or you know one of the other displays somewhere so there's a unique opportunity for everybody we know of people uh they might be the ones who we call the get off my lawn people who remember when car week at monterey was two events and as it became a bigger deal, maybe a 12-headed monster, the week became very crowded, very expensive, right? Do you worry about that or are you conscious of that as you grow? Well, I think if you know, I think it will be a great problem to have. We don't have it yet. Um, but our goal this year, you know, if we can hit 30,000 guests, we would be, you know, extremely pleased. The facility itself is absolutely fantastic. Um, there's been a lot of new construction there, creating environments that that are, you know, I would call it a luxury experience for for the guest. And, you know, I think there's a lot of room to grow. Um, there's other areas. So one of the things that we've done is is we really divide it up so it's never so compressed um that it's it's an annoyance. And I know, you know, as you know, getting around Monterey during car week. Uh, can be a little frustrating, particularly if you're driving in an old car that has a tendency to overheat. Right. Um, but so far, we haven't had that problem. We had a little bit of a problem last year because we didn't expect 20,000 uh, guests to show up on Saturday. <laughs> but um, but we managed to uh, get through it. But you do expect 30,000 this year. Well, we're certainly hoping so. Um, you know, we're keep, you know, pushing out the lineup. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of announcements around, you know, upcoming drivers and, you know, opportunities. So, um, yeah, we think there's no reason why we can't, you know, push past last year's 21,000 into the, you know, either the high 20s or the, you know, hopefully the low 30s would be fantastic. The, so the facility is, can accommodate it easily. Yeah. This is year five. Jeff, what does year 10 look like? Well, I'm hoping by year 10, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the, the it, it will look like uh, a little bit like year five, uh, but kind of times five. So, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, we'll just continue to see, you know, supercars, F1 cars, F1 drivers, uh, Zach, hopefully, um, you know, but whoever whoever had just been involved in Formula One, you know, we hope they will be our guest. But I'll, we'll also see probably a lot of amazing super EV cars, right? So, and then and then in 2010, I'm sure we'll be showcasing autonomous cars. People will be, you know, it's 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 not inconceivable that in five years that you will be able to buy a fully autonomous car. Yeah, exciting to think about uh, autonomous sitting next to one of your uh, nineteen, twenty, or thirty vehicles. <laughs> right, right. Where you had to not only not only you had to drive it, you had to bring along a mechanic. Right. <laughs> a final uh, couple of things. Um, how do you get the word out about Velocity? I mean, social media is at Velocity Invitational on X, formerly Twitter. It is Velocity Invitational. Dot com, but I'm guessing that you, it some of it's word of mouth, some of it's advertising, and some of it's a local outreach, right? And that's exactly right. And I think you know there is no one 
um, uh, catch all that that gets us out there. So we do obviously regional advertising, social media, um, you know, and our our velocity channel has you know has quite a few followers now, and and then the then word of mouth, you know, is really uh what gets it out there and i gotta tell you what thrills me the most is to see these you know young people in their 20s and 30s and they come and they are just so excited to see you know you know they they love seeing the historic stuff but they really love seeing you know what's new what what is the latest out of you know italy or um england or you know there's so much development going on and then this year we're even going to have you know a young team that you know cr- two young guys that just said we want to build our own you know ultimate supercar and and they've been doing it in their garage so you know that car will be on display as well we can't let you go without talking about your personal car collection uh have you expanded your collection since we last spoke uh i may have i'm not really sure what we talked about the last time but um uh, mean- but it is it is a I, I will call it a small but mighty collection of uh, mostly maseratis uh, a few unusual cars, one of the Le Mans uh, four GTs from uh, 2016. Um, but I always have tried to you know, to buy cars that had some unique attribute uh, for whatever the period was. So a Maserati birdcage, you know, that's called a birdcage because it was really the first, you know, lightweight tubular um, uh, chassis that was developed. The chassis weighs about 170 pounds. Um, so I don't think I've had several things under restoration uh in the uk i've have a, a 1949 db2 uh aston martin which ran at le mans um which hopefully will be finished next month uh and i have a ferrari or a maserati at 350s which um just came out of restoration two weeks ago which is the one i mentioned that i was driving backwards down the uh, front straight at monaco which <laughs> i'd like to not do again uh but anyway, that's kind of in a nutshell. We'll end where we started. If you had a dream vehicle that you could take down the streets of Monaco, perhaps for your fourth time or fifth time next time, what would that be? Well, you know, it's that's it's a that's a it's a great question, you know, and uh, uh, it probably would be pretty unique to drive one of the more contemporary uh, F one cars. Um, my buddies have been trying to get me to get into the F1 grid, uh, but you know, but I, 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 I think it would be very, very unique uh, opportunity to 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 scream around uh, Monaco in a '70s F1 car, or or maybe something in the in the 2020s era. <laughs> that that would be even more fantastic. Although I think um, I, I think you probably have to be 25 years old and in better shape than me to, uh, to make one of those cars stick. What those right. guys do, I mean, is truly incredible. Uh, the size of the vehicles too, uh, relative to the size of the track is a big problem in Monaco these days. Well, I think about it because you go around the Fairmont curve, which is the hairpin and, and I do it in the 250F and it's kind of, you know, it's not that easy. And I do it in the 350S, you know, uh, Mille Miglia car. Uh, and then I think about, um, the the f1 guys and they're driving a car that's three feet longer it's amazing how they get around that yeah truly truly well we wish you the best of luck this is year five the fifth annual velocity invitational at sonoma raceway october 4th through 6th and more information uh, as i said earlier at velocityinvitational.com or word of mouth or um just directly from jeff himself here we uh We are very excited to see you. Congratulations on everything that you've built. And if it's 30,000 this year and five times that in five years, then I know what those numbers are, Jeff, but you're going to have your hands full. (laughs) We will, but it'll be a lot easier because I won't have to subsidize it. (laughs) Thank you very much, Jason. Great to be with you. What what a pleasure having you back on the program. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in October uh, out in uh, Northern California. Look forward to it. Bye-bye, Jason. Thank Thank you. you.